Hello there, this is Michael Windsor, uh, creator of the deductive reasoning word game known as Everages. So I'm going to go over how to play this game. So let's go over the objective of the game. So the goal is to expand your empire to have claim to the throne of the Holy Land of Everages. There are three different ways to win. You do one of the ways, you win the game. So, way number one, um, you can get five unrevealed cards. You have five unrevealed cards, you win. They have to be unrevealed. Two, be the last player remaining. So, you can eliminate players by review, having them reveal four cards. So, in a three-player game, these two players would be eliminated, and I would have won the game. Or, use the alternate win condition usually in the library action. So if I use the library action, it says if seven A sanctions are in play, you win. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I'd win. So way number one, five unrevealed cards. Two, be the last remaining player. Three, alternate win condition. Okay, so let's go over how to play the game step by step. So, let me just uh, clean up real quick. Just flip these over. Group them. And reset the game here. Okay. So, basically a turn is as simple as this. Draw a card and use one of your actions. Let me draw the card. Oh, this is the okay. So I'm gonna draw this card. This is um, my secret card. Only I can see. No one else can see. And then I can use one of these eight actions. Um, now, the first two actions are. Actions you don't need to have cards for. <clears throat> the remaining six you do need to have cards for. The green ones, they're the same for all players, and so are the yellow ones. However, the blue ones are unique to whichever leader you've chosen. So, Councilman Theo has his own laboratory and library uh, actions. So, these are your eight actions. Um, to be more specific, basically... A phase is execute any beginning of turn effects. So let's say you have um, a penguin effigy. You have to give the grand penguin two soldiers of sacrifices. Then you draw a card from the deck. Use one of your actions. Then you execute execute an end turn effect. So maybe you have the dagger. The dagger would force you to reveal one of your cards. And then... It's the demise play phase. Yeah, the demise phase. So if there is uh, any player with four revealed cards, that player's out of the game, and that happens during that phase. And if you happen to have five unrevealed cards during the conquest phase, then you win. So those last two phases are kind of like win condition phases. If you don't use an alternate win condition during the action phase or any of those four phases beforehand really so <clears throat> those are basically the phases um <clears throat> now action <clears throat> actions in this game are uh, pretty unique so how you can use an action is let's say i have this treasury right and maybe I have a temple. Now, I can use any eight of these actions. However, I can only use the actions that I have car. Well, I can use any of the eight actions. However, I can lie about them. So, for example, let's say I use the, the temple action. And then I say, I have the temple. So I'm going to give any 
revealed card in play to any player and sanction their action that matches that card. So let's just, for example, have this. I'm going to give you that one, and you are going to have that. However, before that even happens, this person being Domain Katan can say, I don't believe you. I call your bluff. And then I would have to reveal a card. And then because they were incorrect, they would have to reveal one of their cards. Uh, let me get those cards out of the way. So, and then they're basically out of the game. They Or they lose one of their uh, cards that help them to go closer to victory. But they also take damage. Because if you take, f if you have four revealed cards, you're out of the game. So, however, let's say I didn't have this temple. Let's just say it wasn't there. And then I did this. Then I would have to be the one that reveals the card. And this thing that I was going to do, where I was going to sanction and give her this library, that's not going to happen anymore because I lied about it. So that's basically how bluffing works with this game. Um, and then there's also um, each of these actions. So let me go over them. They're pretty basic. Uh, so the first action lets you gain two soldiers. Uh, so that's the recruit action. The war action, if you have at least one soldier, select an opponent to have war with. So I'll go over that in a bit. Now notice this icon right here. This icon uh, basically means that you cannot prevent that action from happening by thwarting it. Um, I believe the term used is piercing. Yes, piercing. So if an action has piercing, it cannot be... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, piercing is, uh, you can't, it can't be guarded against. So, um, we'll go over guarding in a bit, too. Uh, so there's the temple. It lets you give a revealed, one, any revealed card in play to another player, and then you sanction the corresponding action. So, I gave you this laboratory, and then you get a sanction on your laboratory. Um, so it's like a healing effect, if you will. Uh, then there is the mason, which allows you to do two different things. So there's these things called items in the game. Item is basically anything that appears in the text that has blue, all caps, uh, copper plate, gothic, gold font. Um, so let's just let these load for a bit. So with the mason, let's say this person has a canopic jar and this person has... Actually, let's say I have the canopic jar. And for whatever reason, I want to get rid of it, even though that wouldn't make sense in most circumstances. Sorry, you're going to have to wait past the loading. Um, now, I can use this mason action to discard any two items in play or i can give a player the very special item called the wall and the wall lets you automatically guard against any actions without piercing and it acts as a as five additional soldiers when you are defending in a war we'll go over war in a second uh now there's barracks uh, basically, barracks makes it so in turn order, everybody has to discard one of their unrevealed cards. So how you discard cards is you return them to the deck and then you shuffle them. Um, then treachery is simple. You just get five soldiers instead of the recruits, two soldiers, boost your army. So let me just get five soldiers. Uh, in the laboratory, uh, the library are unique to each person. So, see how this says, give any player an idle entreaty? Hers says, sift through the deck for a card to be swapped with any revealed card in play. Reveal that card, shuffle the deck. So, they're different. Um, 
So that is that element. Um, what I did s fail to mention is, um, so if if uh, I were to use an action, let's say I use the temple action again to give her this la uh, laboratory, she can say, I guard with my temple. So if she happened to have a secret temple right here in her hand, she could just block that from even happening. And then I could also say, I don't believe you have that temple to guard with. So you can do that as well. And that's basically what I was saying is that little shield icon, that means no one can use, just say, hey, I guard with my card or I guard with the wall. It pierces everything. Um, all right, so we're also gonna go over war. So war, if you have at least one soldier, select an opponent to have war with. So let's say I have nine and she has six. That means she is probably someone I want to get to a fight with because I have more soldiers than her. Uh, war is pretty simple, unlike in real life. Um, basically, there are four phases. The first one is the designate phase, so determine who is the attacker and the defender. So if it's my turn and I pick someone to go to war with, I would be the attacker because I chose. And the person being selected, or the attack E, they would be the defender. So that is the designate phase. Uh, then the battle phase. So the winner is whoever has the most soldiers. I have nine soldiers. She has six. I am the winner. Okay. Um, now the resolution is the loser must reveal two of their cards, which is pretty devastating because that is basically half of your, your life. So if that happens to you again, you're out of the game. So, unless she uses the temple to heal later on, but that's that. And then lastly, the casualties phase. Now, we would both lose half our soldiers rounded up. So, if I had nine, I would lose five, because that is more than she had six. So, she goes down to three. And we're both more vulnerable to this player over here, who just happened to have... 50 million soldiers, because why not? Um, so that's how war works in Ever Aegis. We've gone over calling bluffs, we've gone over guarding. Um, now we will go over uh, types of cards. So if you notice on the cards, they have little icons. All the default action cards, they have a building icon. The estates, they have uh, a trigger estate effect and a condition estate effect. So basically, a building card is a card you need to safely do an action. So if someone calls a bluff, you can say, hey, no, I actually have that card. That's what a building card is. The trigger estate card is, so the estate cards are basically, they go into effect when they're revealed. So it's like, oh no, I lost my card, but I get to use this effect. So, well, you don't lose it, but you are damaged, essentially. Um, so if you reveal an estate card that's a trigger estate card, the little red icon at the top, that is a one-time effect. So when this card is revealed, give any player the glove, two bears, or the torch. Okay. And then these condition estate cards, uh, they are a constant effect that always affects the game. So in this scenario, while this card is revealed, the player that loses a ward does not lose any soldiers. So if this was revealed, she would have stayed at six after a war. So these kind of add like a little, I guess, twist to the game. Um, so yeah, that's how they work. I mean, these icons are helpful, but 
essentially it is plain English. This says when this card is revealed, and this one says while this card is revealed. So you can infer based on that. Um, now, there's different ways cards are manipulated in the game. Let's uh, go over them. Um, so there's gang. When a, when a text says you gang a card, you simply draw it from the deck, and then you, you, you get it in your... Uh, collection uh, and it's unrevealed of course uh, revealing card is simply flipping over an unrevealed card um, you can't reveal a card that's already revealed um, and then there is discarding let's say I discarded this treasury it would be uh, unrevealed and shuffled into the deck there is sifting so if I sift I basically look throughout the deck and I find the card based on what I'm actually allowed to look at. You might say sift through the top two, so I would sift through the top two cards of the deck. However, no one else would see me sifting, so let me do so that's so secret to me. Um then there's peeking. Let's say this person has these unrevealed cards. I can peek at it and show it to only myself. Also, you can peek at your own cards at any time. They're yours to mess with. And banishing, it's not really something that I think is implemented very much in my game, but probably will in future games, depending on the success of the game. Um, now, banishing basically means it's removed from the game until it's brought back into the game. So, this card would just go out of existence. Okay. No, well, it appeared right there. But it's out of the game, is basically what banishing means. Um, now, there are different things to go over. Um, I think I've gone over... Okay, so... This is the ability, everybody's got this passive ability, and this is how hard they are to use. So if they're uh, five, they're the hardest to use, and one's the easiest to use to help with uh, new people. And then there's also these icons, these are only specific to variant play, which I'm not going to go over. Um, now let's go over items. So items... Um, I don't have, this is a simulation, of course, but, um, there are three icons that appear on the back of an item. Icon will usually have, well, most, no, all, I think all of them do, actually. They have a text on the back with an icon that says what it does and how it's used. So if it has, like, a green swirly, uh... It looks exactly like this. That means the item goes into constant effect while it's in front of you and in play. Uh, consumable item is one that you use during your turn. You basically discard it and then use its effects. Uh, let me get an example of one, just so it's a little, it makes more sense. Um, search. So, um, so this one right here, this is an axe. So once I get it, I can't use it on the turn I just received it, unless it was someone else's turn when I received it. And then I can basically uh, use its effect, so it lets me reveal the card of another player once I discard it. And then there's a reactive consumable, which will have a lightning bolt icon. And basically, uh, uh, it's it's just like the axe, but you can do it at any time and the moment you receive it. So this bird lets you thwart an action used by any player, which means they don't get to do it, and their turn's over. Um, so yeah. That is how items work. Um, 
I believe that is all the things you need to know to play Ever Aegis. So, uh, have fun, play a game, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. And usually, games last just as long as this explanation. And this is a long explanation, but I've covered just about everything. So, feel free to look through it again and and go over the things you need to know. Thanks for listening, and thanks for playing Ever Ages.